Chapter Three of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume Six by Eugène Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Love's Frenzy. It was nightfall when Rodolph went to the notary's. The pavilion occupied by Jacques Ferrand was plunged in the deepest obscurity. The wind roared and the rain fell as it did on the terrible night when Cecily, before she quitted the notary's abode for ever, had excited the passions of that man to frenzy extended on his bed feebly lighted up by a lamp jacques ferrand was dressed in a black coat and waistcoat one of the sleeves of his shirt was tucked up and spotted with blood a ligature of red cloth which was to be seen on his nervous arm announced that he had been bled by polidori who standing near his bed leaned one hand on the couch and seemed to watch his accomplice's features with uneasiness nothing could be more frightfully hideous than was jacques ferrand whilst plunged in that somnolent torpor which usually succeeds violent crises of an ashy paleness his face was bedewed with a cold sweat and his closed eyelids were so swollen so injected with blood that they appeared like two red balls in the centre of his cadaverous countenance another such an attack and he is a dead man exclaimed polidori in a low voice all the writers on this subject have agreed that all who are attacked by this strange and frightful malady usually sink under it on the seventh day and it is now six days since that infernal creole kindled the inextinguishable flame which is consuming this man after some minutes of further meditation polidori left the bedside and walked slowly up and down the chamber the tempest was still raging without and fell with such fury on this dilapidated house as to shake it to its centre despite his audacity and wickedness polidori was superstitious and dark forebodings came over him he felt an undefinable uneasiness in order to dissipate his gloomy thoughts he again examined ferrand's features now he said leaning over him his eyelids are injected it would seem as though his blood flowed thither and stagnated no doubt his sight will now present as his hearing did just now some remarkable appearance what agonies now they endure how they vary oh he added with a bitter smile when nature determines on being cruel and playing the part of a tormentor she defies all the efforts of man and thus in this illness caused by an erotic frenzy she submits every sense to unheard-of superhuman tortures the storm still howled without and polidori throwing himself into an armchair exclaimed what a night what a night nothing could be worse for jacques's present state yes he continued the prince is pitiless and it would have been a thousand times better for ferrand to have allowed his head to fall upon a scaffold better fire the wheel molten lead which burns and eats into the flesh than the miserable punishment he endures as i see him suffer i begin to feel affright for my own fate what will become of me what is in reserve for me as the accomplice of jacques to be his jailer will not suffice for the prince's vengeance perhaps a perpetual imprisonment in the prisons of germany awaits me but that is better than death yet i know that the prince's word is sacred but i who have so often violated all laws human and divine dare i invoke a sworn promise inasmuch as it was to my interest that jacques should not escape so will it be equally my interest to prolong his days but his symptoms grow worse and worse nothing but a miracle can save him what is to be done what is to be done at this moment a crash without occasioned by the fall of a stack of chimneys roused jacques ferrand and he turned on his bed polidori became more and more under the influence of the vague terror which had seized him it is folly to believe in presentiments he said in a troubled voice but the night seems to me very appalling a heavy groan from the notary attracted polidori's attention he is awaking from his torpor he said approaching his bed very quietly perhaps another crisis may ensue polidori muttered jacques ferrand still extended on the bed and with his eyes closed polidori what noise was that a chimney that fell replied polidori in a low voice fearing to strike too loudly on the hearing of his accomplice a fearful tempest shakes the house to its foundation it is a horrible night 
the notary did not hear and replied turning away his head polidori you are not there then yes yes i am here said polidori in a louder voice but i answered gently for fear of giving you pain no i hear you now without any pain such as i had just now for then it seemed as if the least noise burst like thunder on my brain and yet in the midst of it all of these horrible sufferings i distinguished the thrilling voice of cecily who was calling to me still that infernal woman but drive away these thoughts they will kill you these thoughts are life to me and like my life they resist all tortures madman that you are it is these thoughts that cause your tortures your illness is your sensual frenzy which has attained its utmost height once again drive from your brain these thoughts or you will die drive away these thoughts cried ferrand oh never never when my pains give me one moment's repose cecily the demon whom i cherish and curse rises before my eyes what incredible fury it frightens me there now said the notary with a harsh voice and his eyes fixed on a dark corner of the room i see now the outline of an obscure and white form there there and he extended his hairy and bony finger in the direction of his sight there there she is jacques this is death to you yes i see her continued ferrand with his teeth clenched and not replying to polidori there she is and how beautiful how her black hair floats gracefully down her shoulders and her small white teeth shining between her half-opened lips her lips so red and humid what pearls and how her black eyes sparkle and die cecily he added with inexpressible excitement i adore you jacques do not excite yourself with such visions it is not a vision mind mind just now you know you imagined you heard this woman's love songs and your hearing was suddenly smitten with horrible agony mind i say leave me leave me what is the use of hearing but to hear of seeing but to see but the tortures which follow miserable wretch i will brave them all for a deceit as i have braved death for a reality and to me this burning image is reality ah cecily you are beautiful yet why torture me thus would you kill me ah oh, execrable fury cease cease or i will strangle thee cried the notary in delirium you kill yourself unhappy man exclaimed polidori shaking the notary violently in order to rouse him from his excitement in vain jacques continued o oh, beloved queen demon of delight never did i see the notary could not finish he uttered a sudden cry of pain and threw himself back what is it inquired polidori with astonishment put out that candle it shines too brightly i cannot endure it it blinds me what said polidori more and more surprised there is but one lamp covered with its shade and that shines very feebly i tell you the light increases here now again again oh it is too much it is intolerable added jacques ferrand closing his eyes with an expression of increasing suffering you are mad the room is scarcely lighted i tell you open your eyes and you will see open my eyes why i shall be blinded by torrents of burning light with which this room is filled here there on all sides there are rays of fire millions of dazzling scintillations cried the notary sitting up and then again shrieking he lifted both his hands to his eyes but i am blind this burning fire is through my closed lids it burns devours me and now my hands shield me a little but put out the light for it throws an infernal flame it is beyond doubt now said polidori his sight is struck with the same excess of sensitiveness as his hearing was he is a dead man to bleed him in this state would at once destroy him 
a fresh cry ensued sharp and terrible from jacques ferrand which resounded in the chamber villain put out that lamp its glaring beams penetrate through my hands which they make transparent i see the blood circulate in the net of my veins and i try in vain to close my eyelids for the burning lava will flow in oh what torture there are gushes as dazzling as if some one were thrusting a red-hot iron into my eyes help help he shrieked twisting himself on his bed a prey to the horrible convulsions of his extreme agony polidori alarmed at the excess of this fresh fit suddenly extinguished the lamp and they were both in perfect darkness at this moment the noise of a carriage was heard at the door in the street when the chamber had been rendered entirely dark in which polidori and ferrand were the latter was somewhat relieved from his extreme pains where are you going said polidori suddenly when he heard jacques ferrand rise for the deepest obscurity reigned in the apartment i am going to find cecily you shall not go the sight of that room would kill you cecily awaits me up there you shall not go i will prevent you said polidori seizing the notary by the arm jacques ferrand having reached the extremity of exhaustion was unable to contend with polidori who grasped him with a powerful clutch what would you prevent me from seeking cecily yes and besides there is a lamp in the next room and you know what an effect light so recently produced on your sight cecily is up above she is waiting for me and i would cross a red-hot furnace to rejoin her let me go she called me her old tiger mind you then for my claws are sharp you shall not go i will sooner tie you down to your bed like a furious madman listen polidori i am not mad i am perfectly in my senses i know that cecily is not really up there but to me the phantoms of my imagination are equal to realities silence cried polidori suddenly and listening i just now thought i heard a carriage stop at the door and i was not mistaken now i hear a sound of voices in the courtyard you want to deceive me said jacques but i am not so easily deceived but unhappy man listen listen don't you hear let me go cecily is upstairs she calls me do not make me furious and now i say to you mind beware you shall not go out take care you shall not go out it is for my interest that you should remain you would hinder me from seeking cecily and it is my interest that you should die there there said the notary in a gloomy tone polidori uttered a cry wretch you have stabbed me in the arm but your hand was weak the wound is slight and you shall not escape me your wound is mortal for it was given by the poisoned stiletto of cecily which i always carried about me await the effects of its poison ah you release me then now you are about to die i was not to be hindered from going up above to find cecily added jacques endeavouring to grope his way in darkness to the door oh murmured polidori my arm becomes benumbed a death-like coldness seizes on me my knees tremble under me my blood freezes in my veins my head whirls around help help i die and he fainted the crash of glass doors opened with so much violence that several panes of glass were broken to atoms the resounding voice of rodolph and the noise of hastily approaching steps seemed to reply to polidori's cry of anguish jacques ferrand having at length discovered the lock of the door opened it suddenly with his dangerous stiletto in his hand at the same instant as menacing and formidable as the genius of vengeance the prince entered the apartment from the other side monster he exclaimed advancing towards jacques ferrand it was my daughter whom you have killed you are going the prince could not conclude but recoiled in amazement it would seem as if his words had been a thunderbolt to ferrand for casting away his dagger and raising both his hands to his eyes the unhappy wretch fell with his face to the ground 
uttering a cry that was scarcely human to complete the phenomenon which we have attempted to describe and the action which profound obscurity had suspended when jacques ferrand entered the apartment so brilliantly lighted up he was struck with an overwhelming vertigo just as though he had been suddenly cast into the midst of a torrent of light as blazing as the disk of the sun it was a fearful spectacle to see the agony of this man who was twisting in convulsions tearing the floor with his nails as if he would have dug himself a hole to escape from the atrocious tortures occasioned by this powerful light rodolph one of his servants and the porter of the house who had been compelled to guide the prince hither were struck with horror in spite of his just hatred rodolph felt a pity for the unheard-of sufferings of jacques ferrand and desired that he should be laid on the sofa this was not effected without difficulty for from fear of being subjected to the direst influence of the lamp the notary struggled violently and when his face was covered with the full glare of the light he uttered another shriek a shriek which chilled rodolph with terror after fresh and long torture the phenomenon ceased by its very violence having reached the last bounds of suffering without death following the visual torment ceased but according to the regular course of the malady a delirious excitement followed the crisis jacques ferrand became suddenly as stiffened in frame as an epileptic his eyelids until then obstinately closed suddenly opened and instead of avoiding the light his eyes fixed themselves on it immovably the pupils in a state of extraordinary dilation and fixedness seeming phosphorescent and internally lighted up he appeared plunged in a kind of ecstatic contemplation his body and limbs remained at first in a state of complete immobility his features being agitated by nervous twitches and spasms his hideous countenance thus contracted and twisted had no longer any human appearance and it appeared as if the appetites of the animal by stifling the intelligence of the man impressed on the features of this wretch a character absolutely bestial having attained the mortal point of his madness he remembered in his delirium the words of cecily who had called him her tiger gradually his reason forsook him and he imagined he was a tiger his half-uttered breathless words displayed the disorder of his brain and the singular aberration that had seized on him gradually his limbs until then stiff and motionless extended he fell from the sofa and tried to rise and walk but his strength failed him and he was compelled now to crawl like a reptile and now to drag himself along on his hands and knees going coming this way and that way as his visions impelled or obtained possession of him crouched in one of the corners of the room like a tiger in his den his hoarse and furious cries his grinding of teeth the convulsive twistings of the muscles of his face and brows and his ardent gaze gave him a wild and frightful resemblance to this ferocious brute tiger 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 that i am he said in a harsh voice and gathering himself into a heap yes tiger what blood in my cavern what rent carcasses la goualeuse the brother of this widow a small child louise's baby these are the carcasses and my tigress cecily will have her share then looking at his torn fingers the nails of which had grown immensely during his illness he added in broken language oh my sharp nails sharp and keen an old tiger i am but agile strong and bold no one dares dispute my tigress cecily with me ah she calls she calls he said advancing his hideous visage and listening after a moment's silence he huddled himself against the wall again and continued no i thought i had heard her but she is not there yet i see her oh yes always always ah there she is she calls me she roars roars down there i'm here i'm here and ferrand dragged himself towards the centre of the room on his hands and knees although his strength was exhausted he made a convulsive leap from time to time then paused and listened attentively where is she i approach she goes away cecily here is your old tiger he cried as with a last effort he arose and balanced himself on his knees 
suddenly falling back with affright his body bending on his heels his hair on end his look haggard his mouth twisted with terror his two hands extended he seemed to struggle with desperation with some invisible object uttering incoherent words and exclaiming in broken tones what a bite help my hands are powerless i cannot drive away these sharp teeth no no oh not such eyes help a serpent a black snake with its flat head and fiery eyes how it looks at me it is the fiend and he knows me jacques ferrand at church the pious man always at church go go cross yourself and the notary raising himself a little and leaning with one hand on the floor endeavoured to cross himself with the other his livid brow was bathed in cold sweat his eyes began to lose their transparency and become dim all the symptoms of approaching death manifested themselves rodolph and the other witnesses of the scene remained as motionless and mute as if they had been under the effect of a frightful dream oh continued jacques ferrand still half stretched on the floor and supporting himself by one hand the demon vanishes i am going to church i am a holy man i pray what no one will know it do you think so no no tempter be quite sure well let them come these women all yes all if no one finds out but the secret he continued in a tone of exhaustion the secret ah here they are three what says this one i am louise morel oh yes louise morel i know it i am only one of the people you think me handsome here take her what does she bring me her head cut off by the executioner it looks at me that head of death it speaks the livid lips move and say come 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 i will not i will not demon leave me go 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 and this other woman ah beautiful beautiful jacques i am the duchesse de lucenay see my angelic figure my smile my bold glance come come yes i come but wait and who is this one who turns away her face oh cecily cecily yes jacques tis cecily you see the three graces louise the duchess and myself choose beauty of the people patrician beauty the savage beauty of the tropics and hell with us come come hell with you yes shrieked jacques ferrand again rising on his knees and extending his arms to seize these phantoms this last effort was followed by a mortal throw and he fell back again stiff and lifeless his eyes starting from their orbits whilst fierce convulsions were visible on his features unnaturally distorted a bloody foam on his lips his voice hoarse and strangling like that of a person in hydrophobia for in its last paroxysm this fearful malady shows the same symptoms as madness the breath of this monster was extinguished in the midst of a final and horrible vision for he stammered forth these words black night black spectres skeletons of brass red-hot with fire unfold me their burning fingers make my flesh smoke my marrow is scorched fleshless horrid spectre no no cecily fire flame agony cecily these were jacques ferrand's last words and rodolph left the place overcome with horror End of chapter three read by celine major chapter four of the mysteries of paris volume six by eugene sue 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hospital, Part One it will be remembered that fleur de marie saved by la louve had been conveyed not far from the ile du ravageur to the country-house of dr griffon one of the surgeons of the hospital to whom we shall now introduce the reader this learned doctor who had obtained from high influence his position in the hospital considered the wards as a kind of school of experiments where he tried on the poor the remedies and applications which he afterwards used with his rich clients these terrible experiments were indeed a human sacrifice made on the altar of science but dr griffon did not think of that in the eyes of this prince of science as they say in our days the hospital patients were only a matter of study and experiment and as after all there resulted from his essays occasionally a useful fact or a discovery acquired by science the doctor showed himself as ingenuously satisfied and triumphant as a general after a victory which has been costly in soldiers nothing could be more melancholy than the sombre appearance of the vast ward of the hospital into which we now introduce the reader the length of its high dark walls pierced here and there with grated windows like those of a prison was filled with two rows of beds parallel and faintly lighted by the sepulchral glare of a lamp hanging from the ceiling the atmosphere is so nauseous so heavy that the fresh patients frequently did not become accustomed to it without danger and this increase of suffering is a sort of tax which every newcomer invariably pays for his miserable sojourn in the hospital in one of the beds was the corpse of a patient who had just died amongst the females who did not sleep and who had been present whilst the priest performed the last rites with the dying woman were three persons whose names have been already mentioned in this history mademoiselle de fermont the daughter of the unfortunate widow ruined by the cupidity of jacques ferrand la lorraine the poor laundress to whom fleur de marie had formerly given the small sum of money she had left and jeanne duport the sister of pic vinaigre la lorraine was a woman about twenty with mild and regular features but extremely pale and thin she was consumptive to the last degree and there was no hope of saving her she was aware of her condition and was slowly dying there is another gone said la lorraine in a faint voice and speaking to herself she will suffer no more she is very happy she is very happy if she has no children added jeanne aren't you asleep neighbour asked la lorraine how are you after your first night here last night when you came in they made you go to bed directly and i dared not speak to you because i heard you sob so yes i cried a good deal but i went to sleep at last and only awoke when the noise of the doors roused me and when the priest and the sisters came in and knelt down i saw it was some woman who was dying and i said a pater and ave for her and so did i and as i am ill with the same complaint as she had i could not help crying out there is one who suffers no more she is very happy yes as i said if she has no children then you have children three said pigvinaigre's sister with a sigh and you i had a little girl but i did not keep her long the poor babe was injured before she was born and i was so wretched during my pregnancy i am a washerwoman in the boats and worked as long as i could but everything has an end and when my strength failed me bread failed me also they turned me out of my lodging and i do not know what would have become of me if a poor woman had not taken me into a cellar where she was hiding from her husband who had sworn he would kill her there i was brought to bed on the straw but thanks to goodness the good woman knew a young girl as good and charitable as an angel from heaven this young girl had a little money and took me from the cellar and put me in a furnished room where she paid a month in advance and gave me besides a wicker cradle for my baby and forty francs with a little linen besides thanks to her i was enabled to resume my work kind girl well and i also met by chance with such another a young hard-working sempstress i was going to see my poor brother who is a prisoner said jeanne after a moment's hesitation and met this work-girl in the prison and when she heard me tell my brother that i was not happy she came to me and offered me all in her power poor girl i accepted her offer and she gave me her address and two days afterwards dear little mademoiselle rigolette she is called rigolette sent me an order rigolette 
exclaimed lorraine how strange the young girl who was so generous to me often mentioned the name of mademoiselle rigolette in my hearing they were great friends well then said jeanne smiling sadly since we are neighbours in bed we should be friends like our two benefactresses with all my heart my name is annette gerbier called la lorraine a washerwoman and i am jeanne duport a fringe-maker oh it is so fortunate to find in this melancholy place some one not quite a stranger to you especially when you come for the first time and are very full of trouble but don't let us talk of that tell me lorraine what was the name of the young girl who was so kind to you she was called goualeuse and was exceedingly handsome with light brown hair and blue eyes so soft oh so soft unfortunately in spite of her assistance my poor babe died at two months old it was so puny it could hardly breathe and la lorraine wiped a tear from her eye and your husband i am not married i washed by the day at a rich tradesman's in my country and had always been prudent but the master's son whispered his tales in my ear and then when i found in what a state i was i dared not remain any longer in the country and m jules gave me fifty francs to take me to paris assuring me that he would send me twenty francs every month for my lying in but since i left i have not had one sou not even a message i wrote to him once but he sent me no answer and i was afraid to write again as i saw he did not wish to hear any more of me at least he ought not to have forgotten you if it was only for the sake of the child that was the reason he was angry with me for being in the family way because it embarrassed him i regret my child for myself but not on its own account poor little darling it must have been miserable and have been an orphan very early for i have not long to live oh you ought not to have such ideas at your age have you been long ill nearly three months why when i had to work for myself and my child i began too soon the winter was very cold i was attacked with a cold on my chest i lost my child at this time too and nursing her i neglected myself and then my sorrow so that i fell into a consumption decided like the actress who has just died there's always hope at your age the actress was only two years older than i am what was she an actress who was just dead yes and see what fate is she had been as beautiful as daylight and had money carriages diamonds but unfortunately the smallpox disfigured her and then came want and misery and at last death in a hospital no one ever came to see her and yet four or five days ago she told me she had written to a gentleman whom she had formerly known in her gay days and who had been much in love with her she wrote to him to beg him to claim her dead body because she was wretched at the idea of thinking she would be dissected cut in pieces and did the gentleman come no every moment she was asking for him and perpetually saying oh he'll come oh he'll be sure to come and yet she died without any one coming and what she so much dreaded will befall her poor frame after having been rich and happy to die so is very terrible we at least only change our miseries i wish said lorraine after a moment's hesitation i wish you would render me a service what is it if i die as is probable before you go from here will you claim my body i have the same dread as the actress and have laid aside the small sum of money necessary to bury me oh do not have such ideas still promise me all the same but let us hope the case will not happen yes but if it does happen thanks to you i shall not have the same misery as the actress poor woman after having been rich to come to such an end the actress is not the only one in this room who has been rich who else a young girl of about fifteen or so brought here yesterday evening she was so weak that they were obliged to support her the sister said that the young lady and her mother were very reputable persons who had been ruined and is her mother here too no the mother was too ill to be moved the poor girl would not leave 
so they took advantage of her fainting to convey her the proprietor of a wretched lodging-house for fear they should die in his rooms made the report at the police station she is there in the bed opposite you and she is fifteen the age of my eldest girl and jeanne duport wept bitterly pardon me said la lorraine if i have given you pain unconsciously in speaking of your children are they too ill alas i do not know what will become of them if i remain here for a week and your husband as we are friends together lorraine i will tell you my troubles as you have told me yours and that will comfort me my husband was an excellent workman but became dissipated and forsook me and my children after having sold everything we possessed i went to work some good souls aided me and i began to get easy again and was bringing up my little family as well as i could when my husband returned with a vile creature his mistress and again stripped me of everything and so i had to begin all over again poor jeanne you could not help it i ought to have separated myself from him in law but as my brother says the law is too dear i went to see my brother one day and he gave me three francs which he had collected amongst the prisoners on telling his tales so i took courage believing my husband would not return for a very long time as he had taken all he could from us but i was mistaken added the poor creature with a shudder there was my poor catherine still to take your daughter you will hear you will hear three days ago as i was at work with my children around me my husband came in i saw by his look that he had been drinking i have come for catherine says he i took my daughter's arm and i said to duport where do you want to take her to what's that to you she's my daughter let her make up her bundle and come along with me at these words my blood ran cold in my veins for you must know lorraine that that bad woman is still with my husband and it makes me shudder all over to say it but so it was she had long been urging him to earn something by our daughter who is young and pretty take away catherine said i to duport never i know what that wicked woman would do with her i say said my husband whose lips were white with rage do not oppose me or i'll kill you and then he seized my daughter by the arm saying come along catherine the poor child threw her arms around my neck and burst into tears exclaiming i will stay with mother when he saw this duport became furious tore my daughter from me and hit me a blow in my stomach which knocked me down and when i was on the ground he was very drunk you may be sure he trampled on me and hurt me dreadfully my poor children begged for mercy on their knees catherine too and then he said to her swearing like a lunatic if you will not come with me i'll do for your mother i was spitting blood i felt half dead and could not move an inch but i cried to catherine let him kill me first what you won't be quiet said duport giving me another kick which deprived me of all consciousness and when i returned to myself i found my two little boys crying bitterly and your daughter gone exclaimed the unhappy mother with convulsive sobs yes gone my other children told me that their father had beaten them and threatened to finish me then the poor girl was quite distracted and embraced me and her brothers weeping dreadfully and then my husband dragged her away ah oh, that bad woman was waiting for him on the stairs i know and didn't you complain to the police at first i felt only grief at catherine's departure but i felt soon great pain in all my limbs i could not walk alas what i had so long dreaded had happened yes i told my brother that one day my husband would beat me so that i should be obliged to go to the hospital and then what would become of my children and now here i am in the hospital and what indeed will become of my children the neighbors went for the commissary who came i didn't like to denounce duport but i was obliged in consequence of my daughter only i said that in our quarrel about our daughter he had pushed me that it was nothing but i wanted my daughter catherine because i feared the bad woman with whom my husband lived would be the ruin of her well and what did the commissary say why that my husband had a right to take away his daughter as we were not separated that it would be a misfortune if my daughter turned out badly from evil counsels 
but that they were only suppositions after all and that was not sufficient for a complaint against my husband you have but one way plead in the courts demand a separation and then the beatings your husband has given you his behaviour with a vile woman will be in your favour and they will force him to restore your daughter to you but otherwise he has a right to keep her with him but how can i plead when i have my children to feed what can be done said the clerk that's the only way and poor jeanne sobbed bitterly adding and he is right that is the only way and so in three months my daughter may be walking the streets whilst if i could plead and be separated it would not happen alas poor catherine so gentle and so affectionate oh you have indeed a bitter sorrow and yet i was complaining said la lorraine drying her eyes and your other children why on their account i did all i could to bear the pains i was suffering and not go to the hospital but i could not go on i vomited blood three or four times a day and a fever took away the use of my arms and legs and i was at last unable to work if i am quickly cured i may return to my children if they are not first dead from hunger or locked up as beggars who will maintain them whilst i am here oh it is very terrible have you no kind neighbours they are as poor as myself and have five children already it is very hard but they promised to do a little something for them for a week that is all they could do and so cured or not cured i must go out in a week but your friend mademoiselle rigolette unfortunately she is in the country and going to be married the porter said no i must be cured in eight days and i asked all the doctors who spoke to me yesterday but they laughed as they replied you must ask the principal surgeon when will he come lorraine hush i think i hear him now and no one is allowed to speak during his visit replied lorraine in a low voice the daylight had appeared during the conversation of the two women a bustle announced the arrival of dr griffon who entered the room accompanied by his friend the comte de saint remy who took so warm an interest in madame de fermont and her daughter but was very far from expecting to find the unfortunate young lady in the hospital as he entered the ward the cold and harsh features of dr griffon seemed to expand casting around him a look of satisfaction and authority he answered the obsequious reception of the sisters by a protecting nod the coarse and austere countenance of the old comte de saint remy was imprinted with the deepest sorrow his ineffective attempts to find any traces of madame de fermont and the ignominious baseness of the vicomte who had preferred a life of infamy to death overwhelmed him with grief well said dr griffon to him with an air of triumph what do you think of my hospital really replied m de saint remy i do not know why i yielded to your desire nothing is more harrowing than the sight of rooms filled with sick persons since i entered my feelings have been severely distressed bah bah in a quarter of an hour you will think no more of it you who are a philosopher will find here ample matter for observation and besides it would have been a shame for you one of my oldest friends not to have known the theatre of my glory my labours and seen me at work i take pride in my profession is that wrong no certainly and after your excellent care of fleur de marie whom you have saved i could refuse you nothing well have you ascertained anything as to the fate of madame de fermont and her daughter nothing replied m de saint-remy with a sigh and my last hope is in madame d'harville who takes such deep interest in these two unfortunates she may find some traces of them madame d'harville i hear is expected daily at her house and i have written to her on the subject begging her to reply as soon as possible during the conversation between m de saint-remy and dr griffon several groups were formed gradually around a large table in the middle of the apartment on which was a register in which the pupils of the hospital who were to be recognized by their long white aprons came in their turns to sign the attendance sheet you see my dear saint-remy that my staff is pretty considerable it is indeed but all these beds are occupied by women and the presence of so many men must inspire them with painful confusion 
all these fine feelings must be left at the door my dear Acestis. here we begin on the living those experiments and studies which we complete on the dead body in the amphitheatre doctor you are one of the best and worthiest of men and i owe you my life and i recognize all your excellent qualities but the practice and love of your art makes you take views of certain questions which are most revolting to me i leave you these are things which disgust and pain me and i foresee that it would be a real punishment to me to be present at your visit i will wait for you here at the table what a strange person you are with these scruples but i will not let you have quite your own way so remain here till i come for you now then gentlemen said dr griffon and he began his round followed by his numerous auditory on reaching the first bed on the right hand the curtains of which were closed the sister said to the doctor sir number one died at half past four o'clock this morning so late it astonishes me yesterday morning i would not have given her the day through has her body been claimed no sir so much the better it is a very fine one we will not dissect it but i will make a man happy then turning to one of the pupils my dear dunoyer you have long desired a subject your name is down for the first and it is yours oh sir you are too good i am only desirous of rewarding your zeal my dear fellow but mark the subject take possession there are so many who covet it as the doctor passed onwards the pupil with his scalpel incised very delicately an f and d his initials on the arm of the defunct actress in order to take possession as the doctor termed it and the round continued lorraine said jeanne duport in a low voice to her neighbour who is all this crowd of people with the surgeon it is pupils and students oh will all these young men look on whilst the doctor asks me questions and examines me alas yes but it is in my chest that i am ill will they examine me before all these men yes yes it must be so i cried bitterly the first time and thought i should have died of shame i resisted and they threatened to send me away and that made me so ill only imagine almost naked before everybody it is very painful before the doctor alone i can easily comprehend it is necessary and even that is a great deal to submit to but why before all these young men they learn and practise on us that is why we are here why they admit us into the hospital ah uh, i understand said jeanne duport with bitterness they give us nothing for nothing yet still there are times when even that could not be suppose my poor girl catherine who is only fifteen were to come to the hospital would they dare with her before so many young men to oh no i would rather see her die at home oh if she came here she must make up her mind to do as the others do as you and i but hold your tongue if the poor young lady in front hears you they say she was rich and perhaps has never left her mother before and yet her turn comes now only think how confused and distressed she will be i shudder when i think of her poor child hush jeanne here is the doctor said lorraine after having quickly visited several patients who presented nothing remarkable in their cases the doctor at last came to jeanne at the sight of this crowd coming around her bed anxious to see and learn the poor creature overcome with fear and shame pulled the bedclothes tightly around her the severe and meditative countenance of the doctor his penetrating glance his eyebrows always drawn down by his reflective habit his abrupt mode of speech impatient and quick increased the alarm of poor jeanne a new subject said the doctor as he read the placard in which was inscribed the nature of the patient's malady and throwing on jeanne a lengthened look of scrutiny there was a profound silence amongst the assistants who in imitation of the prince of science fixed a scrutinizing glance on the patient after an examination of several minutes the doctor remarking something wrong in the yellow tint of the patient's eyeball approached her more closely and raising the lid with his finger examined it silently then several of the students responding to the kind of mute invitation of their professor drew near 
and gazed at jeanne's eye with attention the doctor then began your name jeanne dupas she murmured more and more alarmed are you married alas yes sir with a profound sigh have you any children here instead of replying the poor mother gave way to a flood of tears it's no use crying answer have you any children yes sir two little boys and a girl of sixteen then followed a string of questions impossible to repeat but to which jeanne could only reply in stammering and after many severe rebukes from the doctor the poor woman was overwhelmed with shame compelled as she was to reply aloud to such questions before such a numerous auditory the doctor completely absorbed by scientific feelings did not give the smallest heed to jeanne's distress and continued how long have you been ill four days sir replied jeanne drying her tears tell us how your illness first disclosed itself sir why there are so many persons here that i dare not pooh where do you come from my dear woman inquired the doctor impatiently would you like to have a confessional brought come come make haste sir these are family matters oh be easy we are all family men here a large family too as you see added the prince of science who was in very high spirits that day come come let us have an end of this more and more alarmed jeanne stammering and hesitating at each moment said i had a quarrel with my husband about the children i mean my eldest daughter that he wanted to take away and i wouldn't agree because of a wicked woman he lived with and who might give bad advice to my daughter so then my husband who was tipsy yes sir for if not he'd never have done it my husband gave me a very hard push and i fell and then soon after i began to vomit blood pooh 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 your husband pushed you and you fell you describe it very nicely why he did more than push you he must have struck you in the stomach perhaps trampled on you or kicked you come answer let's have the truth oh sir i assure you that he was tipsy but for that he would never have been so wicked good or wicked drunk or sober it is not to the purpose my good woman i am not a public officer and only want a fact accurately described now were you not knocked down and trampled under foot yes said jeanne weeping and yet i never gave him any cause of complaint i worked as long as i could and the epigastrium must be very painful don't you feel great heat around that region uneasiness lassitude nausea yes sir i was quite worn out when i gave up if not i should never have left my children and then my catherine oh if you put out your tongue said the doctor again interrupting the patient this appeared so strange to jeanne who thought to excite the doctor's pity that she did not reply immediately but looked at him with alarm show me your tongue which you know so well how to use said the doctor with a smile and he pushed down jeanne's lower jaw with the end of his finger after having had his pupils successively and for some time feel and examine the subject's tongue in order to ascertain its colour and dryness jeanne overcoming her fear for a moment said in a tremulous voice sir i was going to say to you my neighbours who are as poor as myself have been so kind as to take care of my children for a week only which is a great deal so at the end of that time i must be back home again so i beg of you in god's name to cure me as quickly as you can or nearly so that i may return to work and i have but a week before me for discoloured face complete state of prostration yet the pulse strong quick and regular said the doctor imperturbably and pointing to jeanne remark her well gentlemen oppression heat in the epigastric regions all these symptoms certainly betoken hematemesis probably complicated by hepatitis caused by domestic troubles as is indicated by the yellow discoloration of the eyeball the subject has had violent blows in the regions of the epigastrium and abdomen the vomiting blood is a necessary consequence of some organic injury to the viscera on this point let me call your attention to a very curious remarkably curious feature the post-mortem appearances of those who die of the injuries under which the subject is suffering frequently present remarkable appearances 
frequently the malady very severe and very dangerous carries off the patient in a few days and then no trace of it is found end of chapter four part one read by celine major chapter four part two of the mysteries of paris volume six by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain the hospital part two dr griffon then throwing off the bedclothes nearly denuded poor jeanne it would be repugnant to describe the struggle of the unfortunate creature who in her shame implored the doctor and his auditory but at the threat you will be turned out of the hospital if you do not submit to the established usages a threat so terrible for those to whom the hospital is the sole and last refuge jeanne submitted to a public scrutiny which lasted a long time very long for dr griffon analyzed and explained every symptom and then the most studious of the pupils declared their wish to unite practice with theory and also examine the patient the end of this scene was that poor jeanne felt such extreme emotion that she fell into a nervous crisis for which dr griffon gave an extra prescription the round continued and the doctor soon reached the bed of mademoiselle claire de fermont a victim like her mother to the cupidity of jacques ferrand mademoiselle de fermont dressed in a cap of the hospital was leaning her head languidly on the bolster of the bed in spite of the ravages of her malady there might be detected on her open and sweet countenance the traces of a beauty full of distinction after a night of keen anguish the poor girl had fallen into a kind of feverish stupor and when the doctor and his scientific train entered the ward she was not aroused by the noise another first subject gentlemen said the prince of science disease a slow nervous fever if the receiving surgeon is not mistaken in the symptoms this is a real godsend for a long time i have desired a slow nervous fever for that is not an ordinary complaint amongst the poor these affections are usually produced after severe trouble in the social position of the subject and i need hardly add that the higher the position of the patient the more deep is the disease it is moreover a complaint the more remarkable from its peculiar characteristics it is traced to the very remotest antiquity and the writings of hippocrates have no doubt reference to it this fever i repeat has almost always been produced from the most violent grief and grief is as old as the world yet strange to say before the eighteenth century this disease was never accurately described by any author it was huxham whom the science of medicine of the age so highly honours huxham i say who first defined accurately nervous fever and yet it is a malady of the olden time added the doctor jocosely hey 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 it belongs to the great antique and illustrious family of febri whose origin is lost in the darkness of ages but we may be rejoicing too soon let us see if really we have the good fortune to possess here a sample of this curious affection it would be doubly desirable inasmuch as for a very long time i have been anxious to try the effect of the internal use of phosphorus yes gentlemen continued the doctor hearing amongst his auditory a kind of shudder of curiosity yes gentlemen of phosphorus it is a singular experiment that i wish to try and a bold one and but audas fortuna juvat and the opportunity would be excellent we will first try if the subject offers in all parts of the body and particularly in the chest that miliary eruption so symptomatic according to huxham and you will assure yourselves by feeling the subject of the kind of uneven surface which this eruption produces but do not let us sell the skin of our bear before we have killed it added the prince of science who was decidedly in very high spirits and he shook mademoiselle de fermont's shoulder very gently in order to wake her the young girl started and opened her large eyes hollowed by the malady it is impossible to describe her amaze and alarm whilst a crowd of men surrounded her bed all fixing their eyes upon her she felt the doctor's hand gliding under the quilt into her bed in order to take her hand and feel her pulse mademoiselle de fermont collecting all her strength in a cry of anguish exclaimed mother help mother mother by an almost providential chance at the moment when the cries of mademoiselle de fermont made the old count de saint remy spring from his chair for he recognized the voice the door of the apartment opened and a young lady 
dressed in mourning entered very hastily accompanied by the governor of the hospital this lady was the marquise d'harville i beg of you sir she said to him to lead me to mademoiselle de fermont be so kind as to follow me he replied respectfully the young lady is in number seventeen unhappy girl here here said madame d'harville drying her tears ah this is really frightful the marquise preceded by the governor rapidly approached the group assembled beside the bed of mademoiselle de fermont when they heard these words uttered with indignation i tell you it is infamous murder you will kill her sir but my dear Saint-Rémy, do pray hear me i repeat sir that your conduct is atrocious i consider mademoiselle de fermont as my daughter and i forbid you going near her i will have her immediately removed hence but my dear friend it is a case of slow nervous fever very rare i am desirous of trying phosphorus it is a unique occasion promise me at least that i shall have the care of her and take her where you like since you are determined to deprive us of so valuable a clinical subject if you were not a madman you would be a monster replied the count clemence listened to these words with increasing anguish but the crowd was so dense around the bed that the governor was obliged to say in a loud voice make way if you please for the marquise d'harville who has come to see number seventeen at these words the pupils made way with equal haste and respectful admiration when they saw clemence's lovely face which was radiant with so much emotion madame d'harville exclaimed the count de saint-remy pushing the door rudely aside and going hastily towards clemence ah it is god who sends one of his angels here madame i knew you took an interest in these two unfortunate beings and more happy than me you have found them whilst it was chance only that led me hither to be present at a scene of unparalleled barbarity unhappy child see madame and you gentlemen in the name of your sisters and daughters have pity i entreat on a girl of sixteen and leave her alone with madame and these good sisters when she recovers her senses i will have her conveyed hence very well let it be so i will sign her discharge exclaimed the doctor but i will not lose sight of her she is a subject of mine and i will attend her do what you will i'll not risk the phosphorus i promise that but i will pass my nights if needs be as i pass them with you ungrateful saint Remy, for this fever is as curious as yours was they are two sisters who have an equal right to my interest confound the man why has he so much science said the count knowing that he could not confide the young girl to more able hands hey it is simple enough said the doctor in a whisper i have a great deal of science because i study because i experimentalize because i risk and practice a great deal on my subjects and so old fellow i shall still have my slow nervous fever eh yes but is it safe to move this young girl certainly then for the love of heaven disappear with your train come gentlemen said the prince of science we shall be deprived of a precious study but i will make my reports on it to you and dr griffon with his suite continued his round leaving monsieur de saint-remy and madame d'harville with mademoiselle de fermont during this scene mademoiselle de fermont still in a swoon had been attended to by clemence and the two nuns saint-remy said in a low tone to clemence and the mother of this unhappy girl madame the marchioness replied in a voice deeply affected she has no longer a mother sir i learnt yesterday only on my return the address of madame de fermont and her dying condition at one o'clock in the morning i went to her with a medical man ah sir what a fiction it was misery in all its horror and no hope of saving the poor mother whose last words were my daughter what a death good heaven and she so tender so devoted a mother it is frightful i will watch her until she can be moved said clemence and when she can be removed i will take her with me ah madame bless you for what you say and do said m de saint-remy but excuse me for not having before mentioned my name to you i am the comte de saint-remy madame de fermont's husband was my most intimate friend 
i live at angers and left that city from uneasiness at not receiving any news of these two noble and excellent women they had until then lived in that city and were said to be completely ruined which was the more terrible as until then they had lived in ease and plenty ah sir you do not know all madame de fermont was shamefully robbed by her notary perhaps i had my suspicions that man was a monster sir alas that was not the only crime he committed but fortunately said clemence with excitement as she thought of rodolph a providential genius had compelled him to do justice and i was unable to close madame de fermont's eyes assuring her as to the future provision for her daughter thus her death was rendered less cruel i understand knowing her daughter to have your support henceforth my poor friend died more tranquil not only is my interest excited for ever towards mademoiselle de fermont but her fortune will be restored to her her fortune the notary has been compelled to refund the money this man had caused the assassination of madame de fermont's brother in order to make it appear that the unhappy man had committed suicide after having dissipated his sister's fortune but he has now placed the sum in the hands of the worthy cure of bonne nouvelle and it will be given to mademoiselle de fermont the infamous wretch has committed another murder equally infamous what mean you madame but a few days since he got rid of an unfortunate young girl whom he had an interest in drowning assured that her death would be attributed to accident m de saint-remy started looked at madame d'harville with surprise as he recollected fleur-de-marie and exclaimed ah madame what a singular coincidence this young girl they sought to drown in the seine near asnières as i am told tis she tis she cried saint-remy of whom do you speak sir of the young girl whom this monster sought to drown do you know her madame poor dear i love her tenderly and if you knew sir how lovely how prepossessing she was but tell me what you mean dr griffon and i gave her the first assistance first assistance to her and in what way at the ile du ravageur where she was saved saved fleur de marie saved by a worthy creature who at the risk of her life saved her from the seine but what ails you madame ah sir i fear to believe in such good fortune but i pray of you tell me what is the appearance of this young girl singularly beautiful large blue eyes light brown hair yes madame and when she was drowned there was an elderly woman with her it was only yesterday she was well enough to speak and she is still very weak she said an elderly woman accompanied her praised be heaven said clemence clasping her hands with fervour i can now tell him that his protege still lives what a joy for him who in his last letter spoke to me of this poor child with such bitter regrets excuse me sir but you know not how happy your intelligence renders me and will make a person who more than myself has loved and protected fleur de marie but for mercy's sake tell me where is she at this moment near asnières in the house of one of the surgeons of this hospital dr griffon she was taken there and has had every attention and is she out of danger yes madame but only during the last two or three days and to-day she will be permitted to write to her protector oh i will undertake to do that sir or rather i shall have the pleasure of taking her to those who believing her dead regret her so bitterly i can understand those regrets madame for it is impossible to see fleur de marie without being charmed with her grace and sweetness the woman who saved her and has since watched her night and day as she would an infant is a courageous and devoted person but of a disposition so excitable that she has been called la louve i know la louve said the marquise smiling as she thought of the pleasure she had in store for the prince what would have been her ecstasy had she known she was the daughter he believed dead that she was about to restore to rodolph then addressing the nun who had given some spoonfuls of a draught to mademoiselle de fermont she said well sister is she recovering not yet madame she is so weak poor young thing one can scarcely feel her pulse beat 
i will wait then until she is sufficiently restored to be put into my carriage but tell me sister amongst these unfortunate patients do you know any who particularly deserve interest and pity and to whom i could be useful before i leave the hospital oh madame heaven has sent you here said the sister there and she pointed to the bed of pique vinaigre's sister is a poor woman much to be pitied and very bad she only came in when quite exhausted and is past all comfort because she has been obliged to abandon her two small children who have no other support in the world she said just now to the doctor that she must go out cured or not in a week because her neighbours had promised to take care of her children for that time only and no longer take me to her bed i beg of you sister said madame d'harville rising and following the nun jeanne duport who had scarcely recovered from the violent shock which the investigations of dr griffon had caused her had not remarked the entrance of madame d'harville what then was her astonishment when the marquise lifting up the curtains of her bed and looking at her with great pity and kindness said my good woman do not be uneasy about your children i will take care of them so only think of getting well that you may go to them poor jeanne thought she was in a dream she could only clasp her hands in speechless gratitude and gaze on her unknown benefactress once again assure yourself my worthy woman and have no uneasiness said the marquise pressing in her small and delicate white hands the burning hand of jeanne duport and if you prefer it you shall leave the hospital this very day and be nursed at home everything shall be done for you so that you need not leave your children and if your lodging is unhealthy or too small you shall have one found that is more convenient and suitable so that you may be in one room and your children in another you shall have a good nurse who will watch them whilst she attends to you and when you entirely recover if you are out of work i will take care that you are provided for until work comes and i will also take care of your children for the future ah oh, what do i hear said jeanne duport all trembling and hardly daring to look her benefactress in the face why are so many kindnesses showered on me it is not possible i leave the hospital where i have wept and suffered so much and not leave my children again have a nurse why it is a miracle it is no miracle my good woman said clemence much affected what i do for you she added blushing slightly at the remembrance of rodolph is inspired by a generous spirit who has taught me to sympathize with misfortune and it is he whom you should thank ah madame i shall ever bless you said jeanne weeping well then you see jeanne said lorraine much affected there are also amongst the rich rigolettes and goualeuses with good hearts madame d'harville turned with much surprise towards lorraine when she heard her mention the two names do you know la goualeuse and a young workwoman called rigolette she inquired of lorraine yes madame la goualeuse good little angel did for me last year according to her small means what you are going to do for jeanne yes madame and it does me good to say and repeat it to everybody la goualeuse took me from a cellar in which i had been brought to bed on the straw and dear good girl placed me and my child in a room where there was a good bed and a cradle la goualeuse spent the money from pure charity for she scarcely knew me and was poor herself but how good it was was it not madame said lorraine yes yes charity from the poor to the poor is great and holy said clemence with her eyes moistened by soft tears it was the same with mademoiselle rigolette who according to her little means as a sempstress said lorraine some days ago offered her kind services to jeanne how singular said clemence to herself more and more affected for each of these two names goualeuse and rigolette reminded her of a noble action of rodolphe and you my child what can i do for you she said to lorraine i could wish that the names you pronounce with so much gratitude should also bring you good fortune thank you madame said lorraine with a smile of bitter resignation i had a child it is dead i am in a decline and past all hope what a gloomy idea at your age there is always hope oh no madame i saw a consumptive patient die last night yet as you are so good a great lady like you must be able to do anything tell me what do you wish since i have seen the actress who is dead so distressed at the idea of being cut in pieces after her death 
i have the same fear jeanne had promised to claim my body and have me buried ah this is horrible said clemence shuddering be tranquil although i hope the time is far distant yet when it comes be assured that your body shall rest in holy ground oh thank you thank you madame exclaimed lorraine might i beg to kiss your hand clemence presented her hand to the parched lips of lorraine half an hour afterwards madame d'harville who had been painfully affected by lorraine's condition accompanied by m de saint-remy took with her the young orphan from whom she concealed her mother's death the same day madame d'harville's man of business after having obtained favourable particulars respecting jeanne duport's character hired for her some large and airy rooms and the same evening she was conveyed to her new residence where she found her children and a nurse the same individual was instructed to claim and inter the body of lorraine when she died after having conveyed mademoiselle de fermont to her own house madame d'harville started for asnières with m de saint-remy in order to go to fleur de marie and take her to rodolphe End of chapter four read by celine major chapter five of the mysteries of paris volume six by eugene Sue this librivox recording is in the public domain hope spring was approaching and already the sun darted a more genial warmth the sky was blue and clear while the balmy air seemed to bring life and breath upon its invigorating wings among the many sick and suffering who rejoice in its cheering presence was fleur de marie who leaning on the arm of la louve ventured to take gentle exercise in the little garden belonging to dr griffon's house the vivifying rays of the sun added to the exertion of walking tinged the pale wasted countenance of la goualeuse with a faint glow that spoke of returning convalescence the dress she had worn when rescued from a watery grave had been destroyed in the haste with which the requisite attempts had been made for her resuscitation and she now appeared in a loose wrapping dress of dark blue merino fastened around her slender waist by worsted cord of the same colour as the robe how cheering the sun shines said she to la louve as she stopped beneath a thick row of trees planted beside a high gravelled walk facing the south and on which was a stone bench shall we sit down and rest ourselves here a few minutes why do you ask me replied la louve almost angrily then taking off her nice warm shawl she folded it in four and kneeling down placed it on the ground which was somewhat moist from the extreme shelter afforded by the overhanging trees saying as she did so here put your feet on this oh but la louve said fleur de marie perceiving too late the kind intention of her companion i cannot suffer you to spoil your beautiful shawl in that way don't make a fuss about nothing i tell you the ground is cold and moist there that will do and taking the tiny feet of fleur de marie she forcibly placed them on her shawl you spoil me terribly la louve it is not for your good behaviour if i do always trying to oppose me in everything i try to do for your good are you not very much tired we have been walking more than half an hour i heard twelve o'clock just strike from asnières i do feel rather weary but still the walk has done me good there now you were tired and yet could not tell me so pray don't scold me i assure you i was not conscious of my weariness until i spoke it is so delightful to be able to walk out in the air after being confined by sickness to your bed to see the trees the green fields and the beautiful country again when you had given up all hope of ever enjoying that happiness or of feeling the warm beams of the sun fill you with strength and hope certainly you were desperately ill and for two days we despaired of your life i don't mind telling you now the danger is over only imagine la louve that when i found myself in the water i could not help thinking of a very bad wicked woman who used to torment me when i was young and frighten me by threatening to throw me to the fishes that they might eat me and even after i had grown up she wanted to drown me and i kept thinking that it was my destiny to be devoured by fishes and that it was no use to try and escape from it was that really your last idea when you believed yourself perishing oh no replied fleur de marie with enthusiasm when i believed i was dying my last thought was for him whom i so reverence and to whom i owe so much and when i came to myself after you had saved me 
my first thought was of him likewise it is a pleasure to render you any service you think so much of it no la louve the pleasure consists in falling asleep with our grateful recollection of kind acts and remembering them upon waking ah you would induce people to go through fire and water to serve you i'm sure i would for one i can assure you that one of the causes which made me thankful for life was the hope of being able to advance your happiness do you recollect the castles in the air we used to build at st lazare oh as for that there is time enough to think about that how delighted i should be if the doctor would only allow me to write a few lines to madame georges i am sure she must be so very uneasy and so must m rodolphe too added fleur de marie pensively sighing perhaps they think me dead as those wretches do who were set on to murder you then you still believe my falling into the water was not an accident accident yes one of the martial family's accidents mind when i say that you must bear in mind that my martial is not at all like the rest of his relations any more than francois and amandine but what interest could they have had in my death i don't care for that the martials are such a vile set that they would murder any one provided they were well paid for it a few words the mother let drop when my man went to see her in prison proved that has he really been to see that dreadful woman yes and he tells me there is no hope of pardon for herself calabash or nicolas a great many things have been discovered against them and all the judges and those kind of people say they want to make a public example of them to frighten others from doing such things how very shocking for nearly a whole family to perish in this way and they certainly will unless indeed nicolas manages to make his escape he is in the same prison with a monstrous ruffian whom they call the skeleton and this man is getting up a plot to escape with several of his companions nicolas sent to tell martial of this by a prisoner who was discharged from prison the other day for i must tell you my man had been weak enough to go and see his brother in la force so encouraged by this visit that hateful wretch nicolas sent to tell my man that he might effect his escape at any minute and that his brother was to send money and clothes to disguise himself in ready for him to father micou's ah your martial is so kind-hearted i'm sure he will do it a fig for such kind-heartedness i call it downright foolery to help the very man who tried to take his life no no martial shall do no such thing quite enough if he does not tell of the scheme for breaking out of prison without furnishing clothes and money indeed besides now you are out of danger myself martial and the two children are about to start on our rambles over france in search of work and depend upon it we never mean to set our feet in paris again martial found it quite galling enough to be called the son of a man who was guillotined how then could he endure being taunted with the disgraceful ends of all his family well but at least you will defer your departure till i have been enabled to see and speak with m rodolph you have returned to virtue and i promised you a reward if you would but forsake evil ways and i wish to keep my word you saved me from death and not satisfied with that have nursed me with the tenderest care during my severe illness suppose i did well it would seem as though i had done the little good in my power for the sake of gain were i to allow you to ask your friends for anything for me no no i say again i am more than repaid in seeing you safe and likely to do well my kind louve make yourself perfectly easy it shall not be said that you were influenced by interested motives but that i was desirous of proving my gratitude to you hark said la louve hastily rising i fancy i hear the sound of a carriage coming this way yes yes there it is did you observe the lady who was in it dear me exclaimed fleur de marie i fancy i recognized a young and a beautiful lady i saw at st lazare then she knows you are here does she i cannot tell you whether she does or no but one thing is very certain that she is acquainted with the person i have so often mentioned to you who if he pleases and i hope that he will please can realize all those schemes of happiness we used to build when in prison what about getting a gamekeeper's place for my man asked la louve with a sigh 
and a cottage in the middle of the woods for us all to live in oh no that is too much like what we read of in fairy tales and quite impossible ever to happen to a poor creature like myself quick steps were heard advancing rapidly from behind the trees and in a minute francois and amandine who thanks to the kind consideration of the count de saint remy had been permitted to remain with la louve during her attendance on la goualeuse presented themselves quite out of breath exclaiming la louve here is a beautiful lady come along with monsieur de saint remy to see fleur de marie and they want to see her directly at the same moment madame d'harville accompanied by monsieur de saint remy appeared from the side of the walk the impatience of the former not allowing her to wait the arrival of fleur de marie directly the marquise saw her she ran and embraced her exclaiming my poor dear child what happiness does it not afford me to find you thus in life and safety when i believed you dead be assured madame answered fleur de marie as she gracefully and modestly returned the affectionate pressure of madame d'harville that i have equal pleasure in seeing again one whose former kindness has made so deep an impression on my heart ah you little imagine the joy and rapture with which the intelligence of your existence will be welcomed by those who have so bitterly bewailed your supposed loss fleur de marie taking la louve who had withdrawn to a distance from the affecting scene by the hand and presenting her to madame d'harville said since madame my benefactors are good enough to take so lively an interest in my welfare and preservation permit me to solicit their kindness and favour for my companion who saved my life at the expense of her own make yourself perfectly easy on that score my child your friends will amply testify to the worthy la louve how fully they appreciate the service they well know she has rendered you and that is to her they owe the delight of seeing you again confused and blushing la louve ventured neither to reply nor raise her eyes towards madame d'harville so completely did the presence of that dignified person abash and overpower her yet at hearing her very name pronounced la louve could not restrain an exclamation of astonishment but we have not a minute to lose resumed the marquise i am dying with impatience to carry off fleur de marie and i have a cloak and warm shawl for her in the carriage so come my child come then addressing the count she said may i beg of you to give my address to this brave woman that she may be enabled to come to-morrow to say good-bye to fleur de marie that will oblige you to pay us a visit continued madame d'harville speaking to la louve depend upon my coming madame replied the person addressed since it is to bid adieu to la goualeuse i should be grieved indeed if i were to miss that last pleasure a few minutes after this conversation madame d'harville and la goualeuse were on the road to paris after witnessing the frightful death by which jacques ferrand atoned for the heinous offences of his past life rodolph had returned home deeply agitated and affected after passing a long and sleepless night he sent to summon sir walter murphy in order to relieve his overcharged heart by confiding to this tried and trusty friend the overwhelmingly painful discovery of the preceding evening relative to fleur de marie the honest squire was speechless with astonishment he could well understand the death-blow this must be to the prince's best affections and as he contemplated the pale careworn countenance of his unhappy friend whose red swollen eyes and convulsed features amply bespoke the agony of his mind he ransacked his brain for some gleam of comfort and his invention for words of hope and comfort take courage my lord said he at last drying his eyes which spite of all his accustomed coolness he had not been able to prevent from overflowing take courage yours is indeed an infliction one that mocks at all vain attempts at consolation it is deep lasting and incurable you are right what i felt yesterday seems as nothing to my sense of misery to-day yesterday my lord you were stunned by the blow that fell on you but as your mind dwells more calmly on it so does the future seem more dark and dispiriting i can but say rouse yourself my lord to bear it with courage for it is beyond all attempts at consolation yesterday the contempt and horror i felt for that woman whom may the great being pardon before whose tribunal she now stands mingled with surprise disgust and terror occasioned by her hideous conduct repressed those bursts of despairing tenderness i can no longer restrain in your sympathizing presence my faithful friend 
i fear not to indulge the natural emotions of my heart and my hitherto pent-up tears may now freely vent themselves forgive my weakness and excuse my thus cowardly shrinking from the trial i am called upon to endure but it seems to have riven my very heart-strings and to have left me feeble as an infant oh my child my loved my lost child long must these scalding tears flow ere i can forget you ah my lord weep on for your loss is indeed irreparable what joy to have atoned to her for all the wretchedness with which her young days have been clouded what bliss to have unfolded to her the happy destiny that was to recompense her for all her past sorrows and then i should have used so much care and precaution in opening her eyes to the brilliant lot that was to succeed her miserable youth for the tale if told too abruptly might have been too much for her delicate nerves to sustain but no i would by degrees have revealed to her the history of her birth and prepared her to receive me as her father then again bursting into an agony of despair rodolph continued but what avails all that i would have done when i am tortured by the cruel reflection that when i had my child all to myself during the ill-fated day i conducted her to the farm when she so innocently displayed the rich treasures of her pure and heavenly nature no secret voice whispered to me that in her i beheld my cherished and lamented daughter i might have prevented this dreadful calamity by keeping her with me instead of sending her to madame georges oh if i had i should have been spared my present sufferings and needed only to have opened my arms and folded her to my heart as my newly found treasure more really great and noble by the beauty of her heart and mind and perhaps more worthy to fill the station to which i should raise her than if she had always been reared in opulence and with a knowledge of her rank i alone am to blame for her death but mine is an accursed existence i seem fated to trample on every duty a bad son and a bad father murphy felt that grief such as rodolph's admitted of no ordinary consolation he did not therefore attempt to interrupt its violence by any hackneyed phrases or promises of comfort he well knew could never be realized after a long silence rodolph resumed in an agitated voice i cannot stay here after what has happened paris is hateful to me i will quit it to-morrow you are quite right in so doing my lord we will go by a circuitous route and i will stop at bougival as i pass that i may spend some hours alone with my sad thoughts in the chamber where my poor child enjoyed the only peaceful days she was ever permitted to taste all that was hers shall be carefully collected together the books from which she studied her writings clothes even the very articles of furniture and hangings of the chamber i will make a careful sketch of the whole and when i return to gerolstein i will construct a small building containing the facsimile of my poor child's apartment with all that it contained to be erected in the private ground in which stands the monument built by me in memory of my outraged parent there i will go and bewail my daughter these two funeral mementos will for ever remind me of my crime towards my father and the punishment inflicted on me through my own child after a fresh silence rodolph said let all be got ready for my departure to-morrow anxious if possible to create if but a momentary change of ideas in the prince's mind murphy said all shall be prepared my lord according to your desire only you appear to have forgotten that to-morrow is fixed for the celebration of the marriage of rigolette with the son of madame georges and that the ceremony was to take place at bouqueval not contented with providing for germain as long as he lives and liberally endowing his bride you also promised to be present to bestow the hand of your young protege on her lover true true i did engage to do so but i confess i have not sufficient courage to venture in a scene of gaiety i cannot therefore visit the farm to-morrow for to join in the wedding festivities is impossible perhaps the scene might serve to calm your wounded feelings with the thought that if miserable yourself you have made others happy no my friend no grief is ever selfish and loves to indulge itself in solitude you shall supply my place to-morrow and beg of madame georges to collect together all my poor child's possessions then when the room is fitly arranged you will have an exact copy taken of it and cause it to be sent to me in germany 
and you will not even see madame d'harville my lord ere you set out on your journey at the recollection of clemence rodolph started his affection for her burned as steadfastly and sincerely as ever but for the moment it seemed buried beneath the overwhelming grief which oppressed him the tender sympathy of madame d'harville appeared to him the only source of consolation but the next instant he rejected the idea of seeking consolation in the love of another as unworthy his paternal sorrow no my kind friend i shall not see madame d'harville previously to quitting paris i wrote to her a few days since telling her of the death of fleur de marie and the pain it caused me when she learns that the ill-fated girl was my long-lost daughter she will readily understand that there are some griefs or rather fatal punishments it is requisite to endure alone a gentle knock was heard at the door at this minute rodolph with displeasure at the interruption signed for murphy to ascertain who it was the faithful squire immediately rose and partly opening the door perceived one of the prince's aides-de-camp who said a few words in a low tone to which murphy replied by a motion of the head and returning to rodolph said have the goodness my lord to excuse me for an instant a person wishes to see me directly on business that concerns your royal highness go replied the prince scarcely had the door closed on murphy than rodolph covering his face with his hands uttered a heavy groan what horrible feelings possess me cried he my mind seems one vast ocean of gall and bitterness the presence of my best and most faithful friend is painful to me and the recollection of love pure and elevated as mine distresses and embarrasses me last night too i was cowardly enough to learn the death of sarah with savage joy i felicitated myself on being free from an unnatural being like her who had caused the destruction of my child i promised myself the horrible satisfaction of witnessing the mortal agonies of the wretch who deprived my child of life but i was baffled of my dear revenge another cruel punishment exclaimed he starting with rage from his chair yet although i knew yesterday as well as to-day that my child was dead i did not experience such a whirlwind of despairing self-accusing agony as now rends my soul because i did not then recall to mind the one torturing fact that will for ever step in between me and consolation i did not then recall the circumstance of my having seen and known my beloved child and moreover discovered in her untold treasures of goodness and nobleness of character yet how little did i profit by her being at the farm merely saw her three times yes three times no more when i might have beheld her each day nay have kept her ever beside me oh that will be my unceasing punishment my never-ending reproach and torture to think i had my daughter near me and actually sent her from me nor though i felt how deserving she was of every fond care did i even admit her into my presence but three poor distant times while the unhappy prince thus continued to torment himself with these and similar reflections the door of the apartment suddenly opened and murphy entered looking so pale and agitated that even rodolph could not help remarking it and rising hastily he exclaimed for heaven's sake murphy what has happened to you nothing my lord yet you are pale tis with astonishment astonishment of what madame d'harville madame d'harville gracious heaven some fresh misfortune no no my lord indeed nothing unfortunate has occurred pray compose yourself she is in the drawing-room here in my house madame d'harville here impossible my lord i told you the surprise had quite overpowered me tell me what has induced her to take such a step speak i conjure you in heaven's name explain the reason for her acting so contrary to her usually rigid notions indeed my lord i know nothing but i cannot even account to myself for the strange feelings that come over me you are concealing something from me no indeed my lord on the honour of a man i know only what the marquise said to me and what did she say sir walter said she with an unsteady voice though her countenance shone with joy no doubt you are surprised at my presence here but there are some circumstances so imperative as to leave no time to consider the strict rules of etiquette 
beg of his royal highness to grant me an immediate interview of a few minutes only in your presence for i know well that the prince has not a better friend than yourself i might certainly have requested him to call on me but that would have caused at least an hour's delay and when the prince has learned the occasion of my coming i am sure he will feel grateful to me for not delaying the interview i seek for a single instant and as she uttered these words her countenance wore an expression that made me tremble all over but returned rodolph in an agitated tone and spite of all his attempts at retaining his composure being even paler than murphy himself i cannot guess what caused your emotion there must be something beyond those words of madame d'harville's to occasion it i pledge you my honour if there be i am wholly ignorant of it but i confess those few words from madame la marquise seemed quite to bewilder me but even you my lord are paler than you were am i said rodolph supporting himself on the back of his chair for he felt his knees trembled under him nay but my lord you are quite as much overcome as i was what ails you though i die in making the effort exclaimed the prince it shall be done beg of madame d'harville to do me the honour to walk in by a singular and sympathetic feeling this extraordinary and wholly unexpected visit of madame d'harville had awakened in the breasts of murphy and rodolph the same vague and groundless hope but so senseless did it seem that neither was willing to confess it to the other madame d'harville conducted by murphy entered the apartment in which was the prince End of chapter five read by celine major